Welcome to the Chess Channel, the channel where you can learn loads. This is the tournament every single chess enthusiast is looking at, and right now there are way too many things happening. Not only we are experiencing a few surprises in the Masters but in the Challenges too. Aline Robers, the 16-year-old Dutch prodigy is making her mark, showing those Grand Masters who play against her that she is not an easy pushover. Though Aline Robers is not Grandmaster, she is making life extremely hard for anyone who is up against her. Today, all the players from across the sections are having a day to reflect and prepare for tomorrow's games. One game that has ended very unexpectedly has to be the encounter between two arch-rivals. The one is Holland's best, Anish Giri and the other is the mighty Magnus Carlsen. We know any news from yesterday is already old so it is safe to say that this game is old news too. If you have already missed the game of round 4, this is what we have lined up. In order to put some substance to how important yesterday's game was, if you look at how the stats turn out to be when it comes to the games between Giri and Carlsen, Giri generally struggles to beat Carlsen. Whatever Giri tries, he simply falls short but today's game was different. Giri last won from Carlsen back in 2021 during the World Blitz Championship but this was just one game out of 17 games they played since. Let's see why this game in Holland was so important and why it stood out by a clear mile. Giri White shot off this the usual, Carlsen in turn answers with this move, and with a straight c4, Carlsen opts for this push to e6. Knight f3, resulted to this opening on the queen side and Carlsen is going to try something entirely new. It's an interesting move but much of what you see in any opening is tried and tested. Is Magnus Carlsen trying to surprise Giri and if so, is he going to succeed? Anish Giri was neither surprised nor amused. He instantly opened up the diagonal too but this time it was at the opposite end. As soon as Carlsen got his bishop to find the rim of the board, Giri got his own queen to find the second, and out of nowhere, Carlsen is the one with all the unexpected shots. For some mysterious reason, this is how he plays it. Is this a loss of tempo and if so, is this going to lead to repercussions? Giri immediately and without giving it any real thought, got his own bishop to hit the diagonal. Magnus in turn brings up this push to the fifth. But with Giri keeping it calm and composed, he simply wants to avoid any early complications, and this is how he chooses to play it. Carlsen in the end took the pawn. This pawn was captured in this way, and with Magnus getting rid of this pawn using the knight, he is now up by a full pawn. He has a nice queenside bishop located in the diagonal but why would Giri give him the satisfaction? This is normally how the Nimzo works in the Queen's Indian defense. For those who play this variation, they would also know how it continues. With Anish Giri getting his king to safety, Magnus too has a similar goal. In light of trying to get his own king to safety, Magnus prepped this type of response. But as soon as he saw Anish Giri reach in this way, the pressure was now on. Though the knight is in no immediate threat, once this knight makes his way away from f3, this knight will be in trouble. With the reigning world champion knowing basically every single trick in the book, he decided to go for a little adventure. Can any spot what he did and why this move was played? He developed the queenside knight and basically by jumping him here, he now appears to offer him. Shall we explore what is likely to happen should Giri be tempted to have him eliminated? Should you take, and this is the idea to go for this knight move to c6, when this fork appears, this is not something you can afford to dismiss. With both the queen and rook coming under fire, there is no way anyone would be willing to throw in the queen. Anywhere this queen goes, will drop the rook and for this very reason, Carlsen will be in the driving seat. So, for this very reason, when this situation arose on the board, Giri was able to see the likely ramifications of removing the knight, and because of this, decides to go for a much stronger initiative. Can you spot what he chose to do? It was this incredibly strong queen exit to the center of the board. With the knight now coming under a two-pronged attack, and with Carlsen scared to lose him, this knight had to go somewhere and somewhere he went. The only logical spot to place him was to this outpost on f6, and with Carlsen going for it, Giri was full of venom. He pushed along with this move, 
and was very much expecting Carlson to get his own king to safety. And yet, Carlson does not. Though this likely attack on the queen might upset Giri's rhythm, queen f4 can lead to Carlson to castle. And even if you know go after this knight, this likely attack on the queen will either have her sent to this outpost on g4 or to e3 or elsewhere. Does queen a4 work at all? It may look fine to place her here but slowly slowly Magnus would get the chance to develop his pieces nicely and when Magnus develops, he does develop. However, returning to the actual game, as soon as Anish Giri pushed along with this pawn, Carlson either ignores this potential attack on the queen or dismisses it. What he did here was to spend nearly eight of his valuable minutes and decides on an entirely different type of response. This was the move he went for in the end. And this move was to just be able to stop the access to e5. Having said this, this push to d6 was simply not strong enough to prevent e5 from happening. With the queen and rook sitting on the same file, Giri does go for this attack on the knight. And because this pawn on e5 could not be captured, either this knight on e6 had to move out, or Carlson needed to find another move. Three minutes and 40 seconds later, he found an interesting of stopping the knight from being removed and this was by not getting him to move out. Carlson challenged the queen with his queen, and Giri was now faced with a dilemma. Do you trade in, or do you pull out the queen from f5? There are other moves to consider too. What if you try this bishop move, or even something like this pawn push? Some options are much stronger than others but just to satisfy anyone's curiosity, let's see what queen f4 can lead to. Carlson undoubtedly will use the knight to chase after the queen, and should you place her here? After Carlson gets to castle, knight c3 is going to lead to an entirely different continuation. Especially if you get to challenge the queen in this way. If you do, if you take and take, even though this pawn on d6 will be eliminated after bishop f6, Carlson would have a problem. The problem rests with this knight on c3. If you jump him here, rook d8 is most likely to fall short. Once you squeeze the knight into the seventh, be wary of the potential fork when this pawn on e6 is taken. Rook d7 need not lead to the instant removal of this pawn on e6. What if you were to mount the pressure on this pawn by lining up the bishop on this superb outpost on h3? But even if you take on e6, Giri would still be in the driving seat. Rook e8, and Giri can try anything here, from knight g5, bishop g5 or even knight f4. Knight f4 to challenge the knight, and if Carlson trades. Even though this pawn on b2 is bound to fall, even if he does, there is this instant attack on the bishop or even one better. What if you were to challenge the rook in this way? Rook d8 and now rook b1 or even something like this rook move and Giri not only has everything very well protected by Carlson's position here looks more or less grim. If we return to the actual game, when Carlson challenged the queen, Giri was trying to calculate the depth of this move. He spent quite a long time thinking of what to do and how to play it. In the end, and 10 minutes and 16 seconds later, he did go on to trade the queens. And with Carlson getting his knight to capture, not only this knight was out of danger but Carlson's position does not look that bad after all. Giri without any real delay, removed the pawn on d6. Carlson here repositions his bishop to safety, but this very move was about to cost Carlson a great deal. Giri's next move was not hard at. He delivered this check, and only because of this check, Carlson is no longer able to castle. With Carlson losing his castling rights, Carlson was trying to work out where to move his king. If you move him west, do expect to get confronted by this attack, and should the bishops go, rook f8 to stop the forking on f7 is going to lead to another complication. You can either go on and remove this pawn from the 7th or alternatively, you can swap the bishop to the knight in this way. If you go for this avenue of play, this pawn on d6 is the key to everything. If you use him to lift the rook into this outpost, Carlson would be busted. So returning to the game, 
Carlson moved his king out of this check by placing him here. Giri develops his queenside knight, and this gave rise to something Carlson was thinking for just over eight minutes. He jumped the knight into this outpost and was looking to create his own fork to pick up at least one of the two rooks. Is there a way to stop the knight from removing one of the rooks? For starters, rook d1 is strong enough, but Giri too took his time with this Carlson type of initiative. Eight minutes later, and after considering all the likely ins and outs of this variation, Giri decided to jump the knight right into the fifth, and this is the point where the big challenge appears. Do you ignore this knight and opt for the fork on c2, or do you do something else? This knight jump into the center of the board does create a number of complexities. The bishops are staring each other on the diagonals. The situation on c2 is known, but also there is a more immediate point to look at. If you ignore taking the knight on e5, the knight on seven will perish with an incoming check. So taking the correct course of action, this knight was first removed. In turn, Giri grabs hold of the bishop, and with Carlson now without any real delay and in seconds, moves his rook to this outpost. His next move is to try and get rid of the pawn from the sixth. Rook d1 stopping the fork and stopping the taking of the pawn resulted to this move by Carlson. Before we show, can you take an educated guess? This was that move. Knight c4 is aimed at this free passer, and Carlson needs him desperately. Giri took it very easy here. He pushed on with this pawn. Magnus in turn jumps the knight into c2, but this invasion into the second could not be a serious offense. Rook b1 coming away from the knight's reach, led to the avenue of play and for sure this knight jump into the center of board does isolate the pawn on d7. Magnus Carlsen is 99% guaranteed to pick up this passed pawn, but as you know, chess can be simple but also very complex. Anish Giri spent eons on his follow-up response. He took just over 14 minutes of his valuable time to try and find something shocking. And shocking his next move was. Can you try and fish it out? It was this incoming attack on the pawn. Carlson is one of the best and fastest thinkers on the planet. He stopped on this move by Giri and spent 4 minutes and 15 seconds thinking whether he could get rid of this pawn from d7. In the end, after he got him out of his misery, Giri found the best resource he could. He used the position of the knight parked on c3 to back off his endangered bishop, and this is where things went flat. It seemed that time had stopped. Carlson took just over 29 minutes to work out his options. In this point in time, it is believed he knew his decision to pick up the pawn from d7 was backfiring. In the end, this was how Magnus played it. Giri had him where he wanted him. As soon as Giri got rid of this pawn, Carlson rushed to capture too, but it was what was unfolding that gobsmacked the reigning world champion. Once he got confronted by this tremendously strong initiative, why doesn't rook c7 work? It's because of this incoming check, and Carlson falls apart. If you get the rook to back off, after you trade, this pawn will drop with a check and whether you get the knight to cover, this knight in the very center of the board will bite the dust and that would be it. If you instead go king e8, this knight still falls and again that would be it. So now what we looked at some very basic variations, Carlson knew this pawn on c5 was not savable. He was willing to let him drop for the sake of developing. The problem Carlson has is with the very position of his kingside rook and before he can get him to become active, he needs one, two, three different moves. Something he has not got and something he cannot afford to do right now. In this very light, Carlson ejected his king to the seventh. Giri could have applied this incoming check, and even if you go king d8, this pawn will still be history. Knight c8 can easily lead to his sort of attack. Should you now back off the knight? Once you discover this superb initiative, Carlson would need to resign here. Bishop e5, for example, is mostly going to have this bishop to come under fire, and should you back him off to this outpost, you can easily have this knight taken. Take, 
and now knight g5 and this would be a done deal. King e8 to stop the access to f7 will lead to the elimination of this pawn. And even if you try this push, rook e1 would be the answer to all questions. Rook c1 may also be a very strong option to consider. However you choose to move on, Giri will be the only one who is playing for a win, and Carlsen can only be looking at a draw. If rook e1, how strong would this bishop attack be on the rook? Rook e2. And check out what Giri can do here. It's this magnificent knight repositioning. This discovered check would be the icing on the cake. King d8. Take and take. And Carlsen would be dead meat to say the least. We have deviated by quite a lot to get here but at least we hope to have covered all the main variations that can be played. Right after this king exit to the 7th, to allow the rook to enter the game, Giri bypasses the check from e1. Instead, he went on to get rid of this pawn, and because of the double attack on the knight, Magnus knew the score. The knight needed to evacuate this outpost on d4 but where was he to go? Knight e6 to provide some extra support to the king, could have led to this subsequent knight attack on the bishop. This jump also protects the bishop on c5 does it not? Should the knight go to the bishop? This subsequent attack on the knight is not going to cut it. Why not? It would be because of this incoming check. Getting the king to find this outpost is again going to impede Carlsen from getting his otherwise lame rook into the game and we all know what rook we are talking about. If you now chase after this rook in this way, rook c8 is going to drop yet another pawn, and Carlsen's position is now unattainable. Coming back to how this game was played, Giri did not go for knight e4 but this is how he played it. But Carlsen once again was at a loss. Though he could have traded the bishop to the knight on c3, he went on to produce this type of attack to muddy the waters. With Anish Giri taking straight away, Carlsen finally gets what he wanted all along. This rook on the king side was free to go places and places he went. Carlsen activated him and by going after the knight, Giri was by no means rushing to play here. He took just about 4 minutes and 18 seconds and right after deciding this knight was best placed here. Was this a blunder or an ingenious type of response? Why had not Carlsen go for this type of attack and what is the problem he would have if he did go for it? It's here. This bishop repositioning is all you would ever need. Even if you get rid of the knight. Once you hit this knight off the board with an incoming check, if you err and get rid of him, once this discovered check appear, you may want to kiss this game goodbye. King c7 here simply does not work. It falls short to this check and when the king is forced to d6, now you can get the rook out of his misery and this game would end in just a few moves. Coming back to this position, even if you do not touch this bishop, king d7 would not be much better. King g2. And should now this bishop drop, Giri could do the same as before. Come in with this discovery and this is how the rook falls too. Coming back to the original position, Carlsen was clearly able to see how strongly this knight was positioned on a 4 and yet he was powerless to do anything. We momentarily stopped him from finding this outpost on b6 and the way he did this was to place his own knight on this square. There are three potentially interesting moves to go-go. 1 is rook b1, 2 is still to go for knight b6, and 3 is bishop b7. If bishop b7, should the rook chase after him, this is what you are looking to achieve. King d8. And anything or any move to get this bishop on b7 to back off. Bishop d4, bishop f3 or even bishop g2 will do fine. If bishop g2, rook c8. Attack the rook again. And should Carlsen repeat. Now you can try this bishop move. Rook back to c8. And now you can try either bishop d3 or there is another very interesting initiative. What if you took this rook with a check, and when the rook is picked up, now you can try this little intermediate move. If knight e5 then you will certainly have blown it. It all comes down to this nasty fork, and with the rook dropping, it would be safe to say, this game is over.
If you go knight d4 here, this knight on c4 will perish and Carlson will be toast. The last move we can look at is this bishop move right into the center of the board. If you go for this move, once you chase after this bishop, knight e5 will for sure lead to a very tricky move. If you do get tempted, if you try and get rid of this knight to pick up the bishop, you are most likely to have blown your cover. Why? It's because of what is to follow when you carry out the whole variation. If you take, take, and take, be wary of this nasty looking fork and this is how easy you would lose the rook. Once the rook comes off, Carlson would be having the knight and the rook against a bishop and a knight and Giri would be the one to pull his hair. Coming back, we can try yet another variation. What if we still try this knight move? If the knight's to come off, bishop e5 is going to lead to this push. And this pawn would be extremely hard to put the brakes on. Knight c5 going after him, and there is a little trick here. This is the trick we are looking at. Should the knight remove this pawn, once you take with a check, this taking of the rook is going to instantly backfire. With the king and rook sitting on a white square, this incoming check is going to secure at least the rook would it not? King c6, takes, and even if this bishop departs, the game is still over in a few moves. Bishop f5, and this is all she wrote. Now that we have explored much of what could happen, Giri used the rook to mount the pressure on the knight, and now via this bishop repositioning, this was the right time to squeeze in this timely check. King f6, which very much explains Carlson's previous move, led to the knight to chase after the rook and Carlson here was in a pickle. Right after deciding to take the knight, Giri eliminated this knight from the fourth, and as soon as Carlson came in with this response to minimize the threat on the knight, Giri produces the heaviest blow of them all. When Carlson was confronted by it, and this is how Anish Giri provided it, this was the time the reigning world champion throws in the tower by resigning. What a game to say the least with finally Anish Giri being Carlsen in probably one of the most important games in the Netherlands. As a result of this invaluable Anish Giri victory, Carlsen stagnates at two points and Giri himself jumps up and on top of Carlsen with three points. Also with three points is Nodebek Abdusitarov who is sharing the lead with Giri of course. There have been other surprises if you like in Tata in round 4 where Ding Liren was beaten by young Pragna. As a result of this, Pragna moves up the scoreboard with 2.5 points and Ding Liren also stagnates at 2 points. So the two players who expected to score a relatively easy win had been made and now Tata has become extremely unpredictable. Carlsen is up against leader Absu Sadarov and Giri will be facing young Pragna. With more to come of course from Tata, we wish you all the very best and until then, God bless and stay safe.